Chapter 38 Exclusive Allegiance Deuteronomy chapter 12 verses 1 to 16 These are the statutes and judgments which ye shall observe to do in the land which the Lord God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess it all the days that ye live upon the earth. Ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods, upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree. And ye shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire. And ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. Ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God, but unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither thou shalt come. And thither ye shall bring your burnt offerings, and your sacrifices, and your tithes, and heave offerings of your hand, and your vows, and your freewill offerings, and the firstlings of your herds, and of your flocks. And there ye shall eat with the Lord your God, and ye shall rejoice in all that ye put your hand unto, ye and your households, wherein the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Ye shall not do after all the things that we do here this day, every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. For ye are not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance which the Lord your God giveth you. But when ye go over Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God giveth you to inherit, and when he giveth you rest from all your enemies round about, so that ye dwell in safety, then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. Thither shall ye bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the heave offering of your hand and all your choice vows which ye vow unto the Lord. And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God, ye and your sons and your daughters and your men servants and your maidservants and the Levite that is within your gates, for as much as he hath no part nor inheritance with you. Take heed to thyself that thou offer not thy burnt offerings in every place that thou seest, but in the place which the Lord shall choose in one of thy tribes, there thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, and there thou shalt do all that I command thee. Notwithstanding thou mayest kill and eat flesh in all thy gates, whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee, the unclean and the clean may eat thereof, as of the roebuck, and as of the heart. Only ye shall not eat the blood, ye shall pour it upon the earth as water. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 1 to 6. Both the patience and the judgment of God meet with human disfavour. When God in Genesis chapter 15 verse 16 tells Abraham that he will be patient with the Canaanites until their iniquity be full, God's apparent tolerance is met with dismay from some Christians. Their reaction is, Must we wait for generations to pass before God brings in judgment? Again, when God a few centuries later required Israel to destroy these Canaanites, churchmen and anti-Christians have seen this as morally wrong. With Paul, we must say that the clay has no right to judge the potter or the creature to judge his creator. Romans chapter 9, verses 19 to 21. God gives evil men more freedom at times than other men want, but at the same time, his judgments are more thorough than men feel comfortable with. In verses 1 to 3, God says, first, Obey me and live, and second, utterly destroy the pillars and groves of the Canaanite phallic cults, their sexual symbols and practices. God's worship is an exclusive one. There can be none other gods before him. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. 
The Canaanite temples were open-air ones. Their worship was of natural forces, supremely the sexual. Altars, pillars, sexual, and idols were set up in natural surroundings to promote fertility through rituals. Human sacrifices also were offered at times. It is necessary to understand that these ancient cults, like modern environmentalist Gaia, Mother Earth worship, were not lacking in noble sentiments. Archaeological research has uncovered many high-sounding sentiments among the peoples of antiquity. For example, the ancient laws of Manu demanded humane warfare. This is what was said. When he, the king, fights with his foes in battle, let him not strike with weapons concealed in wood, nor with such as are barbed, poisoned, or the points of which are glowing with fire. Let him not strike one who, in flight, has climbed on an eminence, nor a eunuch, nor one who joins the palms of his hands in supplication, nor one who flees with flying hair, nor one who has lost his coat of mail, nor one who is naked, nor one who is disarmed, nor one who looks on without taking part in the fight, nor one who is fighting with another foe, nor one whose weapons are broken, nor one afflicted with sorrow, nor one who has been grievously wounded, nor one who is in fear, nor one who has turned to flight. But in all these cases, let him remember the duty of honourable warriors. Such ancient rules of war were about as effective as the kellogg briand Pact outlawing war, or more recent treaties outlawing nuclear weapons. History cannot be understood by the noble professions of countless men and nations. What God, through Moses, tells Israel in verses 2 to 28 is that their fundamental law must be one altar, one God, and the implications of this requirement. Faith in God requires a total break with the faiths, laws, and beliefs of the world around them. The singleness of faith required a singleness of sanctuary. No man could say that he could worship the true God at any other sanctuary. Not until Israel abandoned attempts at syncretistic worship could the synagogues arise, then the teaching of God's words could take place anywhere, although the temple remained as the sole locale of the true sacrifice. The singleness of faith in the one true God required a singleness of worship. There were no multiple avenues to God. Men did not and do not have the prerogative to pick and choose the way to please God. Moses made it clear that he had good reason to stress this because he shall not do after all the things that we do here this day. Every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. Verse 8 This idea of every man as his own lawmaker, determining what is good and evil for himself, comes from the fall. Genesis chapter 3 verse 5 We meet it again in Judges. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Judges chapter 17 verse 6 chapter 21 Verse 25 When God is not the king, every man makes himself the king. Our text stresses the priority of worshipping the true God. While this worship cannot be separated from God's true sanctuary, it cannot be identified with it. Worship is more than ritual. It is the character of life. Worship is separated from nature in verses 1-7 to because God is the creator of all things, not a part of them. In verses 10-14, to the requirements of the central sanctuary is set forth. In verses 15 and 16, we have the prohibition of the eating of blood. Up until now, the animals had to be sacrificed, that is, butchered at the sanctuary, but in Canaan, Distances would make this impractical. 
all the same, no blood could be eaten. Even at that time, gazelle and deer, clean animals, were not to be killed at the sanctuary. We have here, again, the repetitive language which marks law books. Everything is clearly specified to allow for no excuses. In terms of this, the requirements regarding the sanctuary are important as stated here and elsewhere. First, God ordains and institutes worship, not man. Worship is not a human option. The Enlightenment worked to disestablish Christianity and to reduce it to a human option rather than a necessity. The death of Christendom began when the state became the single order or necessity and Christianity and the church became options and hence of no consequence or necessity. Second, worship requires sacrifice. It is not a matter of option whether or not we tithe, sacrifice or otherwise recognize the priority of God's claims on us. Our relationship to God cannot be reduced to the level of membership in a golf club. It is not a choice but a necessity. Third, worship carries with it a grace for all who see it, not as a human option, but a divine mandate, because God is sovereign, not man. There is another aspect to all this. In verse 12 we are told, All ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God. In the many centuries of Hebrew history, this had reference to the offering of sacrifices and the meal that followed that included widows, orphans and Levites. In Leviticus chapter 23 verse 40, this joy is also cited, there with reference to the Feast of Tabernacles. The joy of faith is not a restricted and egocentric one. This joy comes on God's terms, not man's. As a result, verse 13 declares, Take heed to thyself to be faithful. Our Lord makes it clear how necessary a singleness of life and worship is, declaring, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 The modern state requires a total obedience and submission and resents the claims of the triune God. God permits subordinate allegiances, not rival ones. 